Тест. Тест с лишмо.
ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, it's my great pleasure that uh, I can uh, welcome you at the conference on green transition and its impact on uh, investment and prices. Uh, the, uh, the conference is uh, or was jointly organized by Bank of Slovenia and uh, our colleagues from European Investment Bank. And of course, it's also today's event is uh, jointly co-hosted. Summer is officially, uh, officially over, which is an obvious fact today, but uh, obviously very pleasant months were also marked by some very unpleasant facts. It was the hottest uh, summer uh, on record in Europe and the third hottest globally. It was accompanied by a lack of rainfall, raging fires and receding rivers across the globe. All that worsened the European energy crisis and global shortage of staple crops. The end of summer also brings new discomfort. As the cold months approach, the key concerns are related to security of energy supply, to declining growth rates, and of course, to high inflation. Energy and food remain the main drivers on, on inflation, although the high price growth has increasingly spread to other items as well. In the Euro system, we have already responded by normalizing our monetary policy. Firstly, by abandoning net purchases of securities, and then secondly, by increasing our key interest rates. It was the first increase in 11 years, and now we are finally out of the negative territory. But we expect to rise them further over the next several meetings. And here, my impression is that current pace is appropriate response to elevated inflation, and that we should continue with it through our next policy meetings. But this is not the end of normalization process. Purchases program will have to be modified in order to support our efforts to reduce inflation. And here our response is critical to reduce inflation pressures, to avoid the anchor of inflation expectations and also possible wage price spiral, all that to contain inflation and thus minimize the damage it might have on overall societies. Our policy, however, cannot efficiently address all drivers of elevated inflation. The COVID-related supply-side disruptions and the Russian invasion of Ukraine exposed fragilities of our food and energy systems and our high dependence on foreign supply of raw materials and technologies, including those highly important for green and digital transition. In addition to the diversification of our supply network, the sustainable solutions require ramping up investment in renewable energy sources and other production capacities, development of new greener technologies, and also critical infrastructure. And the green transition in itself will require significant public and private investments. Here, the European Commission estimates that reaching the 2030 climate target requires additional annual private and public investment of approximately 500 billion of euros, which is around 4% of last year's GDP at the EU level. And this in itself is an amount that could already trigger a new investment momentum in, in Europe. Such large-scale large investments require the mobilization of various funding sources, from bank lending to capital markets and also from public finances. Banks are still the main source of financing the European enterprises. And as a supervisor, we encourage them to systematically assess, disclose, and also manage the climate risks in their portfolios. But we, central banks, try to be a good example here in terms of greening of our investment portfolios and in terms of disclosure of our carbon footprint. Climate change consideration are, are also part of our monetary policy decision as they can affect price stability and overall financial stability as a matter of fact. 
Capital markets are also expected to play an important role in mobilizing and allocating financing to green projects. After the European Investment Bank issued the world's first green bond in 2007, the global green and ESG bond markets have expanded significantly, but nevertheless, they still represent a low percentage of new bond issuances. There are plentiful needs and incentives for waste green and other investments, but there are also constraints, domestic and those at the global level. Dear speakers, dear panelists, and dear guests, I believe that today we will have an excellent opportunity to shed more light on these questions and challenges, and especially to discuss what each of us can do and should do to contribute to greener and more sustainable policies. But before doing so, I'm giving the floor to co-host of today's conference, the European Investment Bank. Dear Ricardo, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, dear Governor of the Bank of Slovenia, Bosnian Vazl, dear participants, dear colleagues, dear all. It is a great pleasure uh, to be with you in Ljubljana today, joining Governor Vazl in welcoming you. Let me thank Governor Vazl and his team, as well as our Chief Economist Deborah Revoltella and uh, the European Investment Bank team that work together to put up this conference that is becoming a tradition and a very good tradition. Let me also take this uh, opportunity to introduce Simon Savšek. Simon Savšek uh, will be from next week onwards the head of uh, European Investment Bank Group office here in Ljubljana. It's our representative in the country that you can contact and that uh, uh, will participate to boost business in Slovenia. Simon, I wish you all the best in your new endeavors and I'm sure that Slovenia will greatly benefit from your capacity, competence and enthusiasm. Dear all, when the pandemic hit us in uh, early 2020, many said, including me, that we were facing an unprecedented shock of a magnitude that will not be repeated any soon. I suspect I was wrong. In response to COVID pandemic, fiscal and monetary policy authorities acted in close coordination while respecting their independence and managed to cushion the economic and financial impacts in a very wise manner. It was a huge demand side shock. A large fiscal expansion coordinated with a strong monetary accommodation coupled with an appropriate policy package that allowed the European Investment Bank to provide liquidity support through the European Guarantee Fund to keep firms afloat and to shelter jobs. That time was different. That time, in fact, was very different from the great financial crisis and the ensuing sovereign debt crisis in the euro area. Larger efforts to develop a vaccine delivered, and delivered unexpectedly quickly, and the proper European recovery package was adopted to revamp the European economy with the next generation EU. For the first time ever, an European Union-wide package powered by a large issuance of European Union debt was implemented. For the first time, the European Union member states decided to issue joint debt to boost the European Union budget, sharing the risk. It was a proper mutualization of risk, and rightly so. Common challenges require common answers, and unprecedented challenges require unprecedented answers. And then geopolitical tensions mounted, and it culminated with uh, this unacceptable invasion of Ukraine by Russia. This is a horrendous act of unjustified unilateral aggression that we are confronted with. Dear all, it's not only Ukraine that is under attack. It is the liberal democracy that is being bombed. It is our European way of life based on freedom, on solidarity, on the rule of law that is being attacked. On economic grounds, the war gravated tremendously the pre-existing global supply perturbations with far-reaching economic consequences of which inflation 
and gas supply disruptions are only the most visible part. And this time is different again. The policy response then needs to be different too, but still coordinated. To ensure an efficient policy response and cushioning the financial, economic and social consequences of this crisis. A supply shock is a large contraction of the supply of goods and services, and it is materializing in a context in which demand was still recovering to the pre-COVID trend growth. A large supply shock with a strongly expanding demand leads to a sharp rise in prices, inflation, prices of goods and services for which the supply is disrupted. And then to spillovers through the value chains impacting prices of goods and services that use those that are disrupted as an input. And then you have the so-called indirect effects. And in this context, a good policy coordination is of the essence. To avoid that fiscal policy and monetary policy neutralize each other. And to avoid, to the extent possible, that real economic impacts mount. To avoid a very harsh recession and an upsurge in unemployment. To avoid a collapse of investment in a context of high uncertainty and very high inflation. It is key to pin down inflation expectations. To avoid that direct and indirect inflation impacts translate into large second round effects through the labor market and through wage increases. To avoid an inflation spiral. And this is the key role of monetary policy. At the same time, in a context in which GDP growth is still robust and unemployment is at very low levels, it is time for fiscal policy authorities across the European Union to protect the most vulnerable while building fiscal buffers for a countercyclical response in case the disruptions lead to a severe output contraction and to an upsurge in unemployment. A broad-based fiscal expansion, fueled by an inflation-based boom in fiscal revenue, while economic conditions are still sound and labor market is tight, will only fuel further inflationary pressures and will erode fiscal buffers that will likely be needed later. There are signs that uh, the recession is around the corner. At the same time, in face of a supply shock, repair supply is of the essence, and this can only be made by supporting investments. The need to ensure conditions for investment is key, and fueling inflation expectations can only be counterproductive. In this context, the monetary policy also plays a key role in preserving financial stability. Avoiding that a too fast increase in rates jeopardizes financial conditions for productive investing, investment, fueling inflation further. It is therefore of paramount importance to understand which investments should we prioritize and how. And I'm sure that we'll learn a lot from the conference today. This crisis is an opportunity to accelerate the green transition as the pandemic crisis was to accelerate the digital transformation. Every cloud has a silver lining. Dear all, before the Russian invasion, the European Union has already established the objective to progressively phase out fossil fuels. This requires an increased production and use of renewable energy, the identification of end uses, but most and above all, it requires increasing efficiency in energy consumption. There's no cheaper energy than the energy that is not consumed. The European Union has set ambitious targets to become the first climate neutral bloc by 2050. This was a challenging ambition already before the invasion, and the war in Ukraine is not making it any easier. Natural gas supplies are seriously impaired below what is needed to meet demand, and hence prices boomed. In the Repower EU plan, the European Commission recognizes that the diversification of the gas supplies will take time. It recognizes that it will provide only part of the short-term answer. Scaling up renewables and boost energy efficiency is the other part and the most important part of the response. It is the only, the one and only way to ensure Europe energy security and strategic autonomy in the medium and in the long run. The latest report on mitigation of the International Panel for Climate Change is clear cut. Global greenhouse gas emissions must peak within three years if you want to be credible on the 1.5 Celsius degrees target. But this transition is not a costless one. There will be costs and it is our duty to ensure that they are distributed in a fair manner. We need to be frank 
and clear. We cannot replace existed, existing dependencies by new dependencies. We must accept that transition is already having very visible costs. Let me elaborate on these two aspects. We cannot, invest, we cannot invest in assets that will end up as stranded assets as countries move to a carbon-free economy. But at the same time, we need to bridge the energy gap from fossil fuel-based energy sources. So we need to be realistic. But the focus on investment must be on renewables and energy efficiency, taking into account the geographical, social, and economic foundations and conditions of each member state. Furthermore, the green transition will bring deep social and economic impacts. This is why just transition mechanism was created, to ensure that no one is left behind, to ensure that the transition will not create all winning winners and unrecoverable losers. But be sure, if you think the cost of transition is high, I can tell you that the cost of keeping the status quo are not affordable in any shape or form. The impacts of the current crisis are higher for lower income households that spend most of their income and allocate a higher proportion of it to food and energy goods, but also to financially constrained firms that are more affected, including many young and innovative firms that are likely to suffer more. And at country and regional level, it is also clear that those more exposed to Russian gas and to fossil fuels are being more affected. Policies need to take into account this heterogeneity. Policies need to be target, timely, and temporary. As during the pandemic, we are facing a common challenge, and therefore, solidarity among European member states is of the essence. You can't always get what you want, but if you try hard, you'll find out to get what you need. Tremendous investments are needed. Let me be more concrete. According to the European Commission, energy investments in the European Union need to double in the current decade vis-a-vis -vis the previous decade. To reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55% till 2030, annual investment needs for energy efficiency, renewable energy and electricity grids are north of 400 billion euros. And who will finance these investments? Where will the money come from? It is the private sector that does most of the investment financing. It's no secret. For the private sector to invest, it is crucial that incentives are set correctly. It is key that regulation is appropriate and that investments are viable, that the net present value of green investments is positive and risk return is attractive enough. However, uncertainty and risk premium have increased sharply and inflation is pushing up the project investment costs, making private financing less profitable. Fiscal policy then needs to be very prudent. The fiscal space for countercyclical policies must be preserved to allow for the functioning of automatic stabilizers if the recession materializes. And at the same time, fiscal policy needs to account for the future increase in interest outlays stemming from a move to a less accommodative monetary policy stance. And this must be considered in a context in which a restrictive monetary policy stance might be necessary to anchor inflation expectations and in a context where interest rate spread may widen. But fiscal policy also needs to be targeted towards long-term sustainable infrastructure projects that can boost potential growth. Governments need to set the right incentives to foster private investments, offering digitalized and simplified administrative procedures to support households and firms in renewable energy and energy efficiency investments. Finally, European Union countries must use wisely the funds already available from the next generation EU and from the new multi-annual financial framework. It is key to implement the Recovery and Resilience Facility. The RRF was designed specifically to ensure that both reforms and strategic public investments continue to be implemented without jeopardizing the preservation of the necessary fiscal sound conditions. In this context, the European Investment Bank stands ready to support vital investments. Last year, in 2021, we had a record year. The IB Group signed almost 95 billion euros of funding. This is an all-time high and occurred in very particular circumstances. It will not be repeated, cannot be considered as a benchmark for the future. It benefited from the very successful deployment of the European Guarantee Fund that is now completed. 
In 2021, 43% of our overall financing was devoted to climate action and environmental sustainability projects. We aim at doing more than 50% of our financing for climate action from 2025 onwards. We also accelerated financing of innovation. Innovation is key to ensure a sustainable green transition while preserving cohesion and competitiveness. A record of 20 billion euros of our financing went to support innovation last year. And we will also make a strong contribution to the European Union Just Transition Mechanism. The IB was set to support the cohesion objectives by statute, but most and above all by mission. In 2021, more than 40% of our funding supported cohesion regions. Leaving no one behind remains a cornerstone of the European Union bank activities. This is also the case in Slovenia. In Slovenia, we invested more than 7 billion euros since the beginning of our operations back in 1977. It was a while ago. Last year, it was a record year for EIB in Slovenia too, with more than 250 million euros. I'm sure we can do more. We'll do more, and Simon is here to push for it. Many of these investment activities were done together with Seedbank, our local partner, mostly supporting SMEs and cornerstone, the cornerstone of the Slovenian economy. We also offer advisory services to enhance project preparation, and Slovenia benefits from these services as well. Currently, you have more than 10 active assignments in the country. We just signed a new one with the municipality of Velini to support the shift of the district heating system away from coal. Let me conclude, dear all, Slovenia is one of the greenest countries in the world with a great natural potential and an amazing cultural heritage. A very ambitious green agenda can unlock the key advantages of this wonderful country, a strong social model and an educated work workforce, and can support an economic growth model that is both competitive and sustainable, serving as an European example. And be sure that TIB stands by your side to support these objectives, which will keep Slovenia on track to meet its green transition and digitalization targets by 2030 and 2050. I am looking forward for your uh, lively debate today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Also from my side, I think I was already introduced. For those, uh, I would first like to thank Governor Vasle and his team for supporting us throughout years for this conference. Also, thank you very much, Ricardo, for this kind word. Uh, this, the bar was set very high now for me. So, um, For those who still don't understand us, there is a translation available behind. So this is the only thing I'm going to mention on the administrative uh, things. And I have really, really a great pleasure today to welcome among us the keynote speaker, uh, Professor Kaifesh Bogatai. I think for the Slovenian uh, society, you don't really need to be introduced. I think your, your uh, engagement in climate speaks for itself. Uh, we all know that, among others, uh, you were a member of the Bureau and the editor of the uh, IPCC um, cl Climate Change Report, which was also awarded a Nobel Prize. And uh, this, I mean, with these words, I would just like to welcome you among us. Thank you very much to be here. Uh, good morning from my side. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, I will talk about climate change, of course, but I would also try uh, to enter your financial world with some ideas and thoughts. Uh, Okay, so I will start with a very simple uh, uh, teaching uh, what actually is climate change about, because uh, when you do the greening of uh, any policies, it's good to know uh, where the problem comes uh, from. And uh, of course, uh, the main driver of climate change is use of fossil fuels. And the main problem is coal, when we talk about fossil fuels, but also, we should not forget about deforestation and land degradation. So any project that stops deforestation is also greening. So it's not just about solar energy, for instance. And also land system change, how we change the land is crucial, not just be because we do the deforestation, but it also change albedo, so optical properties of the planet. So it's pure physics. 
Uh, just to show you on the right panel how temperature should uh, evolve without humans. So we can see the bottom line. I don't know if I have a pointer. Oops, no, I will not play with that. The, the lower line is that we would see some fluctuation in the last 50 years, but unfortunately, uh, humans took over <laughs> the temperature, the thermostat of this planet. So we can see uh, this observed temperature in um, dark or in, in, in black, which corresponds with the models that take into account human activities. So it's not just fossil fuels, it's also what we do with agriculture, with deforestation, with land. It's about 15% of the problem, so it's, we should also talk about that. No. Sorry. No. Can you? Am I doing something wrong? <laughs> Maybe I should. Ah. Okay. Okay. I got it. Thank you. Uh, okay. So when we talk about energy, and already my pre ancestors, they they talked about uh, how much energy we consume. Uh, we can see now why the Russian aggression on Ukraine is such a problem. Because many people think that renewables and nuclear energy, the share of that is so strong that we can avoid using fossil fuels globally. But actually, we really depend on coal, on oil and gas. So sometimes the political rhetorics also European rhetorics, how we will uh, become uh, carbon neutral, a continent in uh, 20 years sometimes does not really have the strong uh, physical uh, background. Uh, but I would also like to stress this shape of this curve. It's not linear, it's still exponential. Um, also, we already heard today economic growth. Economic growth, yes, but economic growth so far is also energy use growth, unfortunately. Decoupling did not happen yet. So we sh should be really careful about the shape of this curve, not just the, um, the uh, proportion of each ingredient. So the future. The future, uh, I would not use the future in the singular. I like the word futures <laughs> because it's still time to choose what kind of uh, future are we heading to. Uh, we can see here the worst case scenario if we do nothing if we just globally went on with the business as usual and the best case so this is the best case we can get so we cannot stop climate change this is another illusion because we are using this wording fight climate change when you fight something you have a chance to win <laughs> but actually uh, winning is over. So even in the world with two degrees or 1.5 degrees increase, our uh, ecosystems uh, and probably our lifestyle will have to change. But anyway, it's a huge difference. Sometimes people ask climatologists uh, or not people, the journalists, can you describe what kind of the the the, um, the world would be with I don't know eight degrees warming? We cannot do that. Nobody knows. But it's sure that human race probably could not survive in that kind of uh, circumstances. So yes, there are scenarios and outcomes. Science is very clear about that. So don't doubt that. But reality is different. So when we look, how are we doing with Paris Agreement, for instance, uh, without Paris Agreement, probably we'll be heading this way by the end of the century. Uh, what is on paper, on the Paris Agreement paper, is what we see here somewhere, this one, two degrees. So, uh, presidents and prime ministers signed that they will follow the, this blue line. But actually, uh, current policies are not like that. Maybe in Europe, we have big policies planned for policies, not policies yet, I guess. But the world is much bigger. Don't forget that Europe is only 12% of the solution. 12, not more. So, where's China, US, and so on. Uh, and to complicate situation uh, more, science uh, got, uh, we got this uh, line 
that if we change the system, if we really try to change uh, our energy politics, why not try a bit harder? Because if we follow this here, do things sooner, we can avoid many negative effects. Uh, and my comment to this uh, graph is also maybe you wonder why children or, or, or young people protest on the streets. They protest because of this, uh, this discrepancy, because of this gap. Policymakers signed this agreement, but what are they doing is something else. So because of this gap, you have Fridays for future. And I fully support them, by the way. We are not all in the same boat. Uh, so we have a very nice indicator. So this is important for you when you get a pledge for some countries that they are, have wonderful plans for how to mitigate climate change. But are they really doing their homework? Uh, this is a graph or this is approach then can help you with your data. Because uh, when you are serious about climate protection, you should lower your greenhouse gas emission, you should put renewable energy in place, you should tackle energy use, and of course have climate policy established. So yes, in Europe we have some green uh, countries, congratulations to Portugal for instance, uh, but uh, I will not comment uh, further. I guess you all saw what you wanted to see on this picture. So we are not in the same boat, and this is crucial for European Union, I guess, because solidarity, we will help each other, but actually are we going in the same direction? My answer is no, and sometimes I'm a bit ashamed to come from Slovenia. We are not so green as you think. Okay, so what is uh, happening? What will probably happen this is not the worst scenario. This is not the best scenario. This is reality. So reality for Europe is that we will have in winter time, uh, Zima is winter in Slovene, uh, temperature increase, especially in northern parts of uh, Europe, but summers will be exactly like summer this year. So if you wonder what this graph means, just remember July, June, and August. It's perfect picture of what is on that graph. But more important sometimes than temperature is water. Without water, we cannot do agriculture, we cannot do energy, renewable energy, anything. And regarding water, for instance, this part of Europe, North and Slovenia, including, we will be lucky because in the winter we will have some more time, uh, some more rain. But we don't know how to store that water so far. But summer is hopeless. Summer is again drought, drought, forest fires, lack of uh, yields, not to mention human security, drinking water, and so on. So this is crucial, the summer, but in summer uh, agriculture or forest growth occurs. So this is not the worst case, I, I warn you. This is reality, and we should avoid this in, uh, I hope, uh, in the near, very near future. Uh, so, if we look at the, some economic category, I chose productivity. Productivity, we all know what that means for GDP growth or whatever, but in the hot environment, people cannot work properly. Mistakes are made, injuries are made, not to, to, to talk about uh, even more damage. And uh, maybe this scale is not uh, very clear, but whatever is in red, productivity will drop up to 20%. So 20% less of productivity when we then convert to money, it's at least 5% le re less revenue. And Italy, Portugal, Spain, Greece, many parts of Europe will have this problem. Construction business, you cannot force people to, to work when it's 40 degrees already outside. Air temperature, not to mention the industrial or construction processes. So this is something for bankers to, to think because money is lost because of the heat in summer. But it's not just about productivity. We could really face some climate tipping points, which means no way back. This is catastrophic. This is alarms. And these alarms 
are uh, in many parts of Europe already seen. It's already happening. We can uh, talk about sea level rise, which is not probably in Slovenia, but if you look at Netherlands, e UK, France, and so on, uh, actually people will retreat from these zones. Where will they go? What will happen to industry? What will happen to the economy of these areas? Uh, heat waves, we experience that. Uh, also, we will have problems in tourism because uh, we all know that winters are changing rapidly. But what worries me the most is migration because uh, things are changing much faster also in our vicinity. Syria, North Africa, these are not just countries with the political problems, these are countries where drought is becoming so severe because people from Syria did not move to Europe at the first step. They first, with mega droughts, moved to Damascus. But when you have additional six million people in a city, city explodes. So immigration is something that Europe doesn't want to face. We are paying who knows how much money to Erdogan to keep five million people, refugees there, but this can change in a minute. So we did not, we were not able a few years ago to cope with one million of refugees. We, political situation in, in Europe changed because of migration. Let's be honest. So five additional millions, I don't want to imagine. But by 230, the United Nations projections is that there will be probably 40 billion millions of refugees, half of them hitting for Europe. So this is, I think, a, a tipping point that we should discuss when, also when we do financing of the project. So taking care of future migration is also greening, in a way. Be broad about this term. Okay, so physical risks are maybe not so important because we, we do have some knowledge how to deal with floods. We know how to irrigate, for instance. But political, economic, and social shocks are those who are coming in the package. And of course, fiscal. You're already feeling that, but in the future, your responsibility will be even greater. And probably you are the only uh, light at the end of the tunnel because people do, do, do not change before it's about money, it's about taxes, it's about initiatives. So yes, be brought when you think about climate change risks. Money, uh, there are several horizon projects talking about money and about uh, uh, cost of inaction. Because I still think that we are more or less following that path, inaction. So even with two degrees, you remember what I said, even if it's two degrees, we are not on the safe side. And we could expect economic modeling that about 100 billion of euros will be lost because of climate change. Uh, in different, uh, uh, in different uh, sectors, health is another huge problem because we just talk about COVID impact on health. But you know, climate change kills, heat kills, new diseases kill, but may, maybe in more hidden way that not so direct like COVID did. But if we don't do, so 250 is tomorrow, Believe me, when you get older, it's, it's time runs quickly. So we can see how uh, this amount of uh, money is just going up and up. Uh, and this is, in my view, also conservative modeling. If we want to do some panic, we could come up with much, much, much higher uh, 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 figures. So do read reports like that. So in GDP, this is global. This is not Europe. We can see how uh, big this uh, impact could be uh, regarding to models. Of course, economic models are something that are not so familiar, uh, at least the logic uh, of these models. They are not uh, based on physics. But anyway, uh, we can see the same effect also in this modeling. Even with Paris Agreement, uh, we can count about 5% loss in GDP, which is a catastrophe. If you remember 2008, 5% loss was already uh, alarm for the lending and uh, financial uh, organizations. With no mitigation, uh, practically uh, 
uh, one quarter or, or at least one fifth of the real GDP would be lost just to compensate uh, climate change impact. So yeah, it's a reason, economic reason behind mitigation. Uh, so how to avoid, what to do? I, I, I would like to urge you that there are two ways you have to go. In my view, greening is not just mitigation. Of course, mitigation is urgent and we know much about it and it should be global, it should be done, done right. But also we are already in this situation with climate change is there. Governor was talking about uh, heat waves outside right now, who knows how much of Slovenia is already flooded. So it's extremes and uh, we have to adapt to that. So adaptation is also greening because uh, without adaptation, we will just have a much, much lower quality of life to be short. So fiscal policy, I guess it's a critical role you are actually playing right now in, change, in case of climate change mitigation. Uh, tax policies. So I don't know how far is tax policy taxing carbon. Is this an option or no option? But many of scientists, especially in US, they uh, have a, this feeling that without taxing uh, carbon, there will be not uh, huge changes. But there are also non-tax instruments. You are much more familiar with that than me. Uh, but also uh, without public investments probably uh, uh, mitigation cannot be done. So investing in emission reduction infrastructure is also, in my view, important step in mitigation. But adaptation also. So this is phys physically, uh, fiscally very challenging because adaptation can be even more expensive than uh, mitigation. Um, it requires an increase in government spending. That's why in Slovenia no, we don't have any plans yet because it's a lot of money that had to be found somewhere. Uh, but uh, investing in infrastructure that uh, causes adaptation, if we use long-term uh, thinking, actually makes profit. So it's not just spending, it's also return maybe already in the next flood. So you don't have to wait 20 years to... To, to get uh, investments um, justified, but could be less than that. Maybe I'm too optimistic, but anyway, I'd like to encourage your, your work. And of course, it's also about what was already said by uh, governor and also vice president, that transition should be done with investment in low carbon and climate uh, smart infrastructure technologies, but also, do invest in research because I may sound very competent, but believe me, there's a lot of things science does not know 100%. In times of crisis, this can be also misleading. So yes, research is increasingly important in times of crisis. So uh, which sectors should you really be looking at if you want to make a change? So potential by 230 is the biggest in energy sector. So focus on that and focus on industry. Also forestry, because we need also CO2 things. So all the projects which boost forests or make bigger sinks are important. And of course, transport. So these are four sectors that will make a change. Agriculture, food, buildings, yes, it is important, but we, we, we are in time of crisis, so we should really be careful what are we tackling first. So this is something that maybe is not so known to people. There are wonderful reports. I did read some of them. So the whole uh, banking or, or, or fiscal world is faced with that. So uh, I like these two reports, for instance. You have a lot of ideas. They are pretty new, so practically from this year uh, and uh, many circumstances that we are experiencing are already foreseen here. I think you should actually take leadership because as I mentioned, things will not change. Uh, we could not um, 
uh, expect that people will change because they see the problem. Uh, so it's about taking responsibility. It's about being accountable for climate impact. And of course, stopping the flow to fossil fuels. This is crucial. All my lecture could be in this simple sentence. Okay, of course, decarbonizing economies and balance sheets means exactly that, stopping the flow to fossil fuels. And innovation I was talking about. So yes, uh, and what I see sometimes in banking world, I, 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 this year, I, uh, for the first time in my life, I uh, hear a word when I was talking about solution, one banker uh, said, yes, we will do it, but if it's bankable, <laughs> bankable, yeah, but bankable, what I gathered from his talk is short term thinking. So is it bankable or not? This is from this <laughs> moment till maybe next month. And it was really insulting <laughs> for me because we are talking about future generations. We are not talking about profit of the next month or next year. Uh, so yes, avoiding short-term thinking, I guess it's, it's important if we talk about 1.5 degrees transition. So transformation, innovation in financial system does not come from word bankable, not come from, avoid, uh, for, from short-term thinking. Okay, let me... Uh, con slowly conclude. Okay, you all know that we have to act now. So I get uh, one important thing is exactly what are we doing now? Because I think that understanding of climate change is still not penetrated so much in banking system. Uh, you did not learn that in school. Uh, this is unpleasant thing to learn, uh, but uh, better understanding is crucial uh, when you do lending money or whatever. Um, where to start? As I mentioned before, you should start with the most polluting sectors. So you have to really start there. It's not pleasant. But also there are a lot of uh, firms that don't have clear evidence-based transition plans. So if one firm doesn't have these plans, why finance their project? Uh, but climate change is not the only problem. This is something I would also like to tell you. Climate change is closely connected with other environmental problems that can also have tipping point and can also impact us in nonlinear way. Biodiversity, for instance, is such a problem. Uh, air quality and uh, ocean acidification uh, and so on. So yes, when you do this greening, Please do not look just at climate change. Look at other problems. It's, it's, if you don't know exactly what are indicators for biodiversity, ask science. It's, it's not a problem. You can learn in a day. So be broad. Be broad. Okay, these are my conclusions. So climate change is a threat, long-term threat for growth potential, for livelihoods and well-being in all countries rich or poor. So don't expect, because you're coming from rich countries, that you are immune to climate change. You are not. Uh, global efforts to reduce greenhouse gases continue for the last 30 years or more, but uh, window of opportunity is closing fast. You mentioned uh, three years or five years. Yeah, it's, it's about 2.30. But in 230 already action should be implemented, not just plans made. You and fiscal policy play a critical role. And of course, uh, a lot of uh, interventions I see needed uh, finally include externalities in the prices. That would be fantastic. You don't have excuse that science did not make the methodologies to do that. It's out there, but you don't want to read it, maybe. Especially about using coal. It's very clear what is the real cost of coal electricity. And something that may, I don't want to be offensive, but you should actually redefine what is your service. Whom are you serving, actually? Is it the corporative world? Is it people? Is it everybody? So this is my final message. And at the end, let allow me to be a bit personal. 
So this was me as a scientist, <laughs> but me as a person, I think that we were talking about pandemic. And this sentence I heard or read hundreds of times, recovery from pandemic must be rooted in green growth. So whatever, unfortunately, we are talking about economic growth, it is quite the opposite of fighting climate change. I know that there are some trade-offs, but green growth, I guess, is not any better than growth. So uh, degrowth or circular systems are something that I feel should be also in when we talk about it. And the very last personal thing is, uh, this is not exactly my thought, but I was there when conversation took place. So a colleague of mine said, I used to think that top global event problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that for 30 years, this is exactly the uh, time I was also uh, doing climate change, but we were wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with this, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that, obviously. But <laughs> with multidisciplinary support, banks and financial institutions, you have the opportunity to affect just that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kafesh Bogatai. I think this was a great uh, keynote with many issues opened. I hope we will just cover a bit of them today. And I look for an opportunity to discuss all others with them again at another occasion. And with this, and with, without further ado, I would like to ask Deborah Voltella to present shortly the findings of the IBIS, in particular looking at the green transition for the firms in Slovenia. Thank you very much, and uh, it's uh, really an honor uh, to, to have the opportunity to follow such an inspiring uh, speech. And uh, I, I'm sorry I will get back uh, to basic economics, but uh, trying to give uh, some insight and to link uh, to the challenge that uh, we just had. And the, the key message that I wanted to pass in the presentation is uh, actually and I go back to economics, uh, the very difficult um, macroeconomic condition in which we are. We are, uh, we are uh, in a moment of uh, uh, strong concern, strong concern with the risk of a recession coming up, uh, mounting uncertainty, tightening inflationary pressure, energy shock, inflationary pressures, uh, tightening a con financing a condition. All of these uh, brings... Uh, to uh, a lot of challenge for investment in general. And uh, all of what we heard uh, also means a lot of investment uh, to take place. So my concern is uh, how can we really make sure uh, this investment uh, will continue to take place uh, despite uh, the critical macroeconomic condition uh, we are uh, uh, living in. I'm not going to bring a solution to this, uh, just to bring a few data and a few hints, uh, particularly looking at uh, what is uh, the business uh, sector doing. Uh, the business sector in Europe uh, that we monitor through a survey of European firms uh, that we carry since seven years, I think uh, there are uh, some important elements on what the firms are doing and particularly the fact that it's obvious that they react to price signals. So energy cost may be an incentive for transformation, but it depends how much firms perceive the increase in energy shock and the in energy cost. And that's one element. On the other side, awareness is very important. Firms are getting more aware of the situation, but I will show still that they show a lot of lack of information. And that's a strong constraint to investment activities. And then the last point is skills, I think, in all areas. The interest on event, events like that and the importance of a speech like we just heard is that we are not skilled, we don't understand what's happening and how to incorporate in our behavior also at the company level. And, and I think a skilling and reskilling is extremely important. So I go very much 
we were uh, uh, learning a lot. I go very much uh, down uh, in a practical element, but uh, that's uh, the essence of uh, what I will present. I start, uh, that's uh, the, the key message that uh, I had, but I start with a couple of uh, macroeconomic uh, data. The first one is just an indicator, is uh, the purchasing, uh, purchasing manager index. is an indicator that uh, shows actually expectation in terms of economic dynamics. So you see 50 is uh, the line that says whether expectations are for increase or decrease. We see the sharp contraction and actually we are going through our expectation of recessions at the global, in the US and Europe as well. And I think it's what we read in the newspaper every day and what we see in the data. Inflation, we all know, and I'm talking in a central bank, so I don't enter too much into this, but inflationary pressure are very strong coming from the energy side, but not only from the energy side. I think we start seeing also some, some element in the non-energy sector and quite a widespread in the number of good affected. It's still mostly a surprise story, but we see some element also on the demand side. This calls for a reaction on monetary policy, and that's what we start seeing. We see now monetary policy tightening. is not yet shown in terms of a tightening of financing conditions. Actually, we know it's coming, but if you look at the moment, you have banks that are tightening the lending standards, but rates are not really moving yet up, the lending rates, and you don't really see the transmission. As economists, we know it will come. Most of the business know it will come, but it's not there yet. And then uh, you have uh, all of these. Uh, you have uh, the inflation, the tightening monetary condition, uncertainty. You have a recession coming. All of these uh, goes against investment. And again, it goes against investment in a moment in which is uh, clearer than ever that we need investment. What I have in the graph is something uh, that we started monitoring uh, uh, at the time of uh, the sovereign debt crisis. I think it's a very interesting graph uh, to look at it also now. This is a uh, productive investment. We define it uh, as uh, uh, corporate investment and public sector investment. And uh, basically you take out uh, the um, real estate component. And what you see is uh, the gap uh, Europe versus US. Uh, we made a big fast times ago at the time of the Juncker plan on the fact that Europe had a, a two percentage point gap of this productive investment versus the US. And it was kind of a 10 year gap. So you accumulate every year much less. And it's a times of climate change, fighting climate change. You need to invest for it. It's a time of digitalization. You need to invest in the digitalization and the digital transition. And you continue to accumulate the gap. And then we had a moment in which it was almost closing and now it's a re reopening. So to me, the policy message today is uh, we are uh, in difficult macro condition. This is going to go against investment, but we know that we have needs, uh, the energy transition, the green transition, digitalization, and uh, we have uh, a gap accumulating over time. Uh, we really need uh, to do something for that. And it's both uh, the private sector and the public sector moving together. That's the outlook. And then I, I say something and then I move to our survey of European firms and they pass a couple of messages. So the COVID pandemic was somehow was a, a very difficult situation for the business side, but also it showed the capacity to transform in period of crisis. We have, a, one, we have a, done a lot of analysis through this survey, but also looking at the behavior of firms, the balance sheet, performance of firms uh, through the crisis. What we saw is uh, that in the moment of the shock, firms uh, started uh, to react. We have in the survey two questions, whether firms uh, adopt advanced digital technologies and also whether they reacted to COVID and uh, reacted uh, taking action, uh, including becoming more digital. And this becoming more digital is uh, starting a digitalization process, uh, project. So, having uh, online services, uh, selling online, the easy part, if you want. What we saw is that uh, during the pandemic, actually, there was a, quite an acceleration of uh, this uh, 
easy part of digitalization, but uh, it was a debt, but not really the advanced digital technology. In the latest data that you don't see um, in this graph, because we, we are just analyzing now, but what we see is that the firms not only took advantage of this start of the digitalization process, they are actually consolidating it. And now we see also more use of advanced digital technology and also reaping the benefit of this. So it's also translating in higher productivity of the firms. And that's kind of, uh, it's all, it was a lot of policy support coming up, but a policy support that allowed incentive for transformation. And if you want, is a positive example of something that was moving in the right direction during the pandemic. I, it's my hope that we can do something like that with, uh, in this uh, current phase. But then I show you something on uh, what are firms uh, doing and thinking in terms of uh, the green uh, transition. We ask uh, firms, and it's complicated uh, to explain firms uh, what are these concepts, uh, but uh, basically we ask uh, firms uh, two things. Um, if they are concerned, uh, um, if they had already an impact uh, due to physical uh, risk, uh, we define it, uh, so we tell them uh, what it is, etc. I'm not so sure all of them understand, but uh, that's what we, we try to do. And you see the firms that think it's a major, we had a major impact, a minor impact or not an impact at all. And what we see is actually at the European level, very few actually think it's a major impact. Uh, the majority still see an impact. I think in Slovenia, the awareness is uh, slight, is lower than the European uh, average. It's uh, slightly improving in the newest data, but not uh, that much. The first graph is the one on transition risk. Again, it's even more complex to explain what a transition risk is. But here I find it very interesting, the fact that the majority of firms in Europe, not really the majority, but in Slovenia, the majority of firms have no clue what it is. So we ask, do you expect it to be a risk for you, an opportunity for you, or you don't know? And most don't know. Then uh, you have a little bit of those uh, that, that think it's a risk. And normally they are in the high energy intensive sectors, so those uh, that uh, need to know it's a risk. And uh, you have a group that is actually quite interesting uh, that see it uh, as an opportunity. They are those investing. And actually we see that those that see it as an opportunity are also in, uh, in uh, the the less risky sectors because they are getting the opportunity there. What we see in the newest data in Slovenia, as in the EU, awareness is increasing, so the gray bar is shrinking, and a little bit the, both the, uh, the one at risk, so the red and the green are expanding. So there is a little bit more awareness coming up. And I think the whole policy narrative of the last year, so on the green transition, et cetera, is getting firms more, um, more aware. We also ask firms if they are investing already or planning to invest to deal with climate change, to deal with physical and transition risk. This is a collapse in the two concepts, so it's a, a bit vague. Uh, you see that uh, uh, these are the numbers of 2001 referring to 2021 referring to 2020. We also have the new data now that we are analyzing and not in the graph. What you see is uh, Slovenia was lagging behind uh, Europe. Europe was much ahead of the US and Slovenia was like the US. So with uh, around 30% of firms already investing and 40% planning to invest. Now we see in the latest data, we see a big push forward. So actually there are around 50% of firms that are actually investing, catching the U that is also expanding. And on the other side, also the plan to invest is increasing. So it seems that there is a bit more, more action on the firm side coming up in terms of investing for climate. We look also at investment for energy efficiency. And here, and here on energy efficiency, um, firms 
tend to be uh, at the Slovenian level, at, uh, you tend to be particularly uh, large firms more prone to investment uh, in, uh, in uh, energy efficiency. What we find is not uh, in the graph, but uh, what we find uh, is uh, that in fact uh, to motivate in investment in energy efficiency, a couple of elements really count. On the one side, uh, definitely perception of energy cost for the firms is one important uh, driver, but there also uh, knowing what to do is uh, really important. So both the uh, skills on the one side and having, having an energy audit is something that really motivates the firm to transform. So we get back to skills. Skills in the firms are very important to motivate the, uh, the transition and even energy efficiency. The last, uh, um, the last uh, graph uh, is uh, something that we always monitor over time, uh, barriers to investment as perceived by the firms. We normally add, and that's uh, again uh, the old data, but I will tell you the new data for, uh, for uh, uh, Slovenia this year. Uh, we always have availability of uh, skilled staff uh, and uh, um, uncertainty as uh, the biggest barrier for firms. This year, in the new data just coming out, uh, the, the, the big uh, increase is uh, not a surprise, it's energy cost. In fact, in Slovenia, we have that 84% of firms think that energy cost is an impediment, and 70% think it's a major impediment. It's a huge, it's a huge transition. So, actually, when you have uh, such a strong signal, uh, on the perception of firms is probably the moment to try to create an environment for more investment in the transition to come up. This is mostly, and I, I have to say a disclaimer, I, I fully agree that transforming the energy sector is, a, you had the ranking of sectors, so I'm mostly not looking at the energy production side and the energy sector, I'm mostly looking at the other sectors. So I think you need really a combination of policies, uh, how and uh, how you redesign uh, your energy sector, uh, that's one, and then uh, you have uh, the behavior of the corporate sector, and that's uh, a combination of work of uh, public, private sector, uh, financial sector, scientists also giving uh, the indication. I think it's uh, something that has to come together. If I, I conclude, and I probably took too much time, my concern is that we are in difficult times for investment, but we have a lot of investment needs. And the hope is that this brings more of what we need also for the transition and the transformation of the corporate sector. And then it's very much awareness, making sure we don't distort incentives. The Higher energy costs are a stimulus for energy, uh, for, uh, for investment and transformation. So we have also, we have to take care of the social part, but also make sure that we don't distort incentives. And then uh, investment in skills remain very important. The, the green transition cannot happen if there are not enough skills in all the areas that need to be transformed. Thank you very much. So hello everyone, um, I, I will, I'll be very short on the introductions. I'm super happy we, we have here with me uh, Tina Zumer, the Vice Governor of the Slovenian Central Bank. Uh, we have Damian Kozamernik, the um, uh, Chief Economist of Sidbanka, and Maureen um, Schuller, the Head of Financial Sector Strategy of the ING. Um, we, we are a bit short on time, to be honest with you, as always is the case when the debate is interesting. Um, so we will go through two topics today. First of all, we are going to concentrate on the current economic situation and a bit discuss the impacts that the war in Ukraine brought. And then we will move to the main topic uh, of today's discussion, the, the green transition. Uh, Tina, let me start with you. Um, we know that 
basically we, we are coming from shock to shock uh, now and in these uh, very uncertain times I give you a difficult task to tell me a bit where the Slovenian economy is currently standing, what are the forecasts, what are the risks. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, being invited to this panel. Uh, so, uh, Slovenia has been uh, affected by the two global shocks uh, as other European countries. And let me start by saying that the recovery, the post-pandemic recovery was very quick and quicker and faster um, and stronger than we expected. Uh, and also the first half of the year remained uh, fairly strong in terms of growth prospect. So uh, what we are seeing now, it's uh, of course the deterioration of sentiment and the outlook uh, worsening. So our now cast model suggests stagnation for the current quarter and then um, we don't have such a good uh, forecast uh, for growth for next year. And, um, so we are currently in the process of preparing the new forecast, but uh, given the very good growth performance in the uh, previous quarters, we still expect this year growth to be around 6%. But then for the next year to be lower what we uh, uh, anticipated in June, probably around uh, 2%, but we will see uh, by, by December how things evolve. As you know, they change very quickly. On the inflation side, um, let me say that yeah, that has been the major impact of the war has been seen in the inflation that has been uncomfortably uh, and persistently high. Uh, latest figure uh, was 11.5% for Slovenia, 9%, 9.5 for the euro area. And as you have heard today, so this is not only about the energy prices. The inflation started to pick up already last year due to the in, uneven recovery, post-pandemic recovery. And uh, so the energy and commodity prices are only added to this uh, much stronger, but we see both also demand factors playing a role. This is also why the, the monetary policy has um, responded. And of course, the risks going ahead are mainly associated with the geopolitical situation. So if, uh, for instance, the scenario that would uh, stop, uh, assume a uh, stop in the imports from energy from Russia would probably uh, mean uh, GDP contraction for Slovenia, as was the scenario for the euro area published in September. And um, for the prices, of course, the commodity prices outlook uh, is very uncertain. But what is key for us is really how these currently high inflation rates will translate into the behavior of price setting for firms and wage demands. And for this, it's very crit critical that the, the inflation expectations remain anchored and uh, consistent with our price stability objective, which is 2%. And only this way we will be able to bring that inflation down uh, gradually. Let me say that in the current scenario, we expect inflation to come down only in the next quarter of the year, second quarter of the next year. So this is a bit the outlook. So probably I don't need to ask, I think that also Vice President before said that uh, investment outlook is also very, very hard to predict currently. I saw that there is already a bit slowdown in the, in the last quarter, so lots of uncertainties ahead. Uh, Damian, I'm, I'm turning to you. Uh, I think that the pandemic generally changed how uh, development banks also and also us, the, the EIB, uh, basically operate. First we had, a, I would say, a bit of a problem with the low interest rate environment. Now the situation is changing. How would you assess this uh, fast moving uh, that we need to shift our attention basically from year to year? In terms of uh, crisis, this is already the third one that uh, uh, is compelling us to intervene in a counter-cyclical manner. Um, first on, on the COVID intervention uh, and uh, perhaps a few words on how this time this will be a bit different, and then on interest rates, or perhaps I will, st I will start with the easy part, the interest rates. Um, actually, it's, it's, uh, the jury is uh, pretty much out of, uh, in, in terms of the impact of interest rates. Um, we benefited from them on, the, on our liability side, so we had uh, access to, to very affordable financing. So we, we, we went for a much long-term uh, bond issuance uh, and uh, that, that was transmitted into the corporate credits that 
that we landed. Uh, and we also took advantage of the TLTRO, uh, which was a significant measure, short-term measure, medium-term measure, but, uh, but this, this helped. Now the banks are probably going into another type of problems, at least in Slovenia, in the cost squeeze, because we have a lot of indexation uh, in our cost structure, so it will it will not be easier now with uh, with uh, with higher interest rates in terms of banking. In terms of our intervention, uh, we have now something like uh, between 15 and 20 percent in the market share in corporate lending, uh, direct uh, uh, and uh, the lending that we are performing through banks. Uh, so we have, uh, let's say a possibility to impact uh, the credit development and therefore macroeconomic situation to some extent uh, uh, on the market, on a macroeconomic scale. Uh, and uh, if needed, we will do our, uh, the, the scale of our operations again, such as in the COVID where we increased our direct lending by 30%. Uh, and uh, that uh, on aggregate uh, actually uh, produced only a mild, mild uh, receding in corporate credit. Otherwise it would be around 5%. So it was close to a bit more than 1%. So sizable intervention, but also appropriate in terms of instruments. Uh, we, we have also tapped this uh, uh, the before mentioned uh, scheme of the EGF, the European Guarantee Fund. Uh, uh, implemented together with EIB or EIF, uh, but also other other intervention programs uh, targeted because uh, every time that you want to intervene in a macroeconomic countercyclical uh, manner, you also want to have high long-term impact. So you are predominantly targeting investment and uh, research development and innovation within within the corporate sector. Um, all, all that said, uh, this time probably uh, we will have uh, more liquidity uh, problem in the corporate sector. So we will also have to be, care, uh, be careful to provide uh, uh, a bit shorter term loans, uh, um, working capital loans. Uh, we expect the demand for this to rise and we are ready to, to act in this sector also. Maureen, a very similar question to you. So also for the banks, the environment was quite challenging. A lot of liquidity on one side, uh, and now probably the conditions are already tightening. Maybe some insights? Uh, yeah, I think uh, for the banking sector, um, the situation has completely uh, changed. Um, if we go back a few years ago, of course, uh, central banks, um, they were hitting two birds with one stone, you could argue, actually. Um, they were fighting deflation and could... Meanwhile, also support uh, economic growth, bank lending growth uh, through being very uh, accommodative. And at this particular point in time, uh, we are in a situation where it's for central banks uh, extremely important to, to maintain credibility and um, anchor, as we have already heard also in, in earlier speeches, anchor uh, those inflation expectations. So uh, that gives actually quite uh, limited uh, room to maneuver. Um, interest rates are going to move up uh, on the uh, public sector side. Uh, following COVID, there is also far uh, less room to be accommodative uh, in terms of the current uh, crisis. So we are here in a situation where interest rates are going to rise, where you could argue, okay, for a banking sector from a margin perspective, uh, generally that is a more favorable uh, condition. Um, but I think uh, how the banks will be impacted uh, by it will pretty much also differ on their uh, business model. I think, for instance, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, where I'm coming from, uh, we have seen actually uh, that during uh, the past couple of years, many, many mortgage takers have set their uh, mortgage loans for 20 years at very low interest rate terms. So banks uh, that have a similar uh, model, they actually witness a rise in their funding costs where, uh, while at the same time uh, facing actually ongoing uh, uh, low uh, rates on their uh, lending. 
uh, elsewhere where uh, models are more dependent, I, I would say, on floating uh, rates. So banks have actually more opportunity to, to quickly increase um, mortgage, uh, mortgage rates uh, following actually the rise in, in funding costs. Uh, they will face a different problem, namely that households uh, face rising borrowing costs in the wake of already rising energy prices um, and rising inflation levels, so rising prices also for other uh, consumer goods. So here you will definitely see uh, challenges, in my view, in terms also uh, where it comes to the loan performance. Uh, these are just uh, some uh, simple um, um, examples. Uh, all in all, what I do think, and that is very positive, uh, that since the credit crisis, um, that actually uh, the position for, from banks to to to, um, uh, to face this type of crisis has become so, so much stronger. And not only uh, um, in the core European part uh, or northern European part, but also in the southern European part, you have seen actually a tremendous decline also in non-performing loans. Uh, bank capital levels are much better uh, than they were uh, during previous crisis. Uh, so I think all in all, um, the starting position is much better against this crisis. Yeah. yeah, I think you tackled a very important issue of real estate prices. It's a similar situation, I think, also in Slovenia. But unfortunately, today we're not going to discuss it because it would need, we would need a separate event for this. So I would like to turn now to the, to the, really to the issues of climate change. And as I said, you know, following COVID, we, we all believe that now it's going to be time for, uh, for focusing on the long-term action. And then we were interrupted by the war in Ukraine. And again, I was a bit afraid also with uh, Professor Kaifesh Bogatai showing us the charts in which directions we are actually going and what we promised. Um, and uh, Tina, for you, uh, what is the effect of climate change and the transition to a more sustainable growth model here in Slovenia, also taking into account the, the Slovenian uh, I would say, basically, where, where we're located and uh, how do you see it? Uh, yes, yeah, so as you said, uh, the climate change uh, issue should not get forgotten despite the, the, uh, the uh, attempts, let's say, or trade-offs that we are facing now due to the, to, to the war. I mean, we see the, the impact of climate change. We also, uh, we as a policymakers, we, have, we are faced with high inflation. But uh, we have seen uh, the droughts that has, have been uh, uh, mentioned before. So this has also clearly impacted the Slovenian economy through uh, lower crops, higher food prices, less energy production coming from the hydropower, the river transportation uh, was hit. So these are all uh, so-called uh, the manifestation of the physical risks. So that was a demand shock. And if more such weather, extreme weather events happen, uh, we could have more of these um, uh, supply shocks that have, of course, the knock-on effects on demand. Uh, imagine higher prices, lower purchasing power, higher ins insurance premium, uncertainty, lower investment, what we've heard so important going ahead. Uh, so uh, yes, overall, I think um, there are no precise estimates. Uh, it, the impact will be very multifaceted. It will also heterogeneous across sectors and across countries. Um, so, but let me point out for Slovenia maybe three issues in that respect, uh, namely um, investments, uh, the um, integration of a Slovenian economy in the global value chains and energy dependence. On the first one, um, Slovenia has been confronted with the large <coughs> investment gap, persistent, not so large, but investment gap towards uh, with respect to the EU average, let's say. And um, so this investment gap, of course, represents or like hinders the faster transition to a higher living standards and um, represents a big opportunity now in this green transition. So we can actually be, it can be a catalyst, it can kind of a fast forward that, uh, that process of convergence and investment. But here I would like to point out two things, uh, namely we have heard a little bit before about that. It's um, the financing availability and the financing costs. Regarding the cost, we could expect that the cost of finance for less, uh, less green investment will be higher. 
and what we've seen currently in the bank uh, exposure that is relatively higher. So the bank's uh, financing of firms in Slovenia, it's relatively more skewed towards the, the, the brown than in the euro area. So the share is 16 versus 8% in, in the euro area. So that means overall impact on investment, investment costs can be higher. Uh, the other thing is the access of finance. What has also been presented in the survey, what we've seen before, um, the first thing, the Slovenian firms are a bit more constrained. And the other thing is that they rely heavily on internal sources, less on external financing. And especially not on the financing of the, of the non-banking sector. And what research has shown, and we know that this is exactly the sector that will be critical to support the green transition. So we need to get more of this financing going, like venture capital. I mean, these are projects that are typically riskier with longer term returns, so we need to, to, to. So this financing would be very important. And maybe for the final on investment, the, 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 what the, uh, the survey has shown, so the awareness in Slovenia of the climate uh, transition is low, and the investment in this climate uh, has been uh, low, but I hear good, <laughs> Uh, news, encouraging data, the recent data, it's better than it was before, yeah. Uh, then on the two other points, on the global value chains, I think this transition will be managed in Slovenia in the co context of the broader transition to the more sustainable business models. Because we have high uh, integration in the global value chain, manufacturing, especially auto automotive industry, these are also then um, let's say sectors that we've seen that are more, most prone to the transition and uh, but also more um, high energy consumers. So this brings me to my last point of the energy dependence. Um, yes, so we will need to, so there is opportunity for trans transformation of these sectors to reduce the energy dependency, uh, which had had not only impact on investment and will, it will have the impact on investment, but also for us for inflation energy inflation in Slovenia has accelerated to 40% and has spread throughout other sectors and also for, to the public finance. So there are measures to mitigate this impact that uh, estimate, were estimated at about 1% of GDP and going ahead, of course, without uh, the transition to more sustainable business models, uh, this can also pose threat to the uh, public finance uh, sustainability. Okay, thank you for this elaborate answer. Um, Damian, when we were together with Tina here at the Bank of Slovenia, the green topics didn't show up as uh, really, you know, we were, st we were starting, but it was not really the core, uh, the core of the agenda. Uh, similarly, when I moved to the ECB and then when I moved to the EIB, we were already well established as a climate bank. And I guess at the seat you had a similar transformation process. Am I correct in that? Well, we tried... Uh... She actually tried even before I, I went to see it from Central Bank um, to to tackle the problem uh, which uh, was already in on the horizon for at least ten to fifteen years. Uh, the way the way we do at Seed Bank uh, uh, is that uh, all uh, significant financing uh, is uh, evaluated with respect to. Uh, the business model of the firm because we are not really financing a lot of pure green projects but we are financing firms and then we want to introduce conditionality on this financing so that the business models become, become sustainable. So <clears throat> already, already for some time Seedbank is uh, evaluating business models of uh, its clients not only with respect to carbon emissions but also with respect to the circularity of their business model, because this is really the, the other the other thing. It's it's not on, on no, not only about only about uh, climate change and uh, and heating. It's also about scarcity of resources and efficiency of the business models to to survive in the long run. So this is what we do. We want also so to introduce this in, into our risk uh, policies and into our pricing policies. This is something easy. The, the difficult uh, part comes when you want really to address pure green projects, pure transition projects. Uh, we have uh, uh, for that implemented very 
uh, generous, let's say, uh, conditions and programs in terms of uh, uh, interest rates, for example, in terms of um, uh, terms, so very long-term loans with a long moratoria, uh, very accessible in, for the firms that have low collateral. But uh, uh, to a large extent, these problems uh, were uh, disappointing in terms of, uh, uh, of respondents, in terms of volumes generated. So now uh, we, are really, uh, we are really thinking about how to move forward for this uh, specific uh, area of our activity. And probably uh, financial engineering instruments that we have will have to be significantly upgraded. So not only, uh, not only uh, will we have to subsidize interest rates, but also th there will be a combination with, with public funds uh, uh, to, uh, in terms of the capacity of firms to refund the principal of the loan. Because here is a typical case where externalities intervene in, into, into uh, the firm's decision. There is a pricing uh, price uh, signal, but it's also the capacity to repay the loan out of new generated business, which is not enough if, you, if you're only transforming your uh, production. So there is a need of public intervention, uh, uh, and the most efficient will, uh, intervention would involve kind of uh, sharing uh, between subsidies and loans, uh, and therefore attract firms uh, and compel firms together with the other policies, so tax changes, etc., compel to compel the firms to accelerate in in, in changing their business models. Um, this is nothing else than to say making making uh, the loan bankable. Actually, there is no way that the banks will do non -bankable, non bankable loans because otherwise uh, we will not be sitting here, uh, but in, in another department, which is a supervisory department, <laughs> and we will not have lunch with the government. So uh, uh, that said, uh, attracting uh, 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 development banks and also commercial banks will involve uh, sharing uh, risks, sharing uh, loans uh, with public resources, and therefore, uh, with this type of financial instruments address the issue in, in a sufficiently uh, large way. Because if you're doing some niche programs, uh, you're not changing things. We have to make significant moves. We have to provide loans that are in percentage points of GDP, not in percentage points of our balance sheet. Uh, so we have some way to go. We already... Uh, made, uh, uh, let's say, avail available these projects to the Ministry of Finance with very positive response from them. Uh, and of course, uh, probably this, this will be something for Slovenia that will be a game changer in this particular month. Otherwise, greening the balance sheet uh, is, of course, something that, that is that is our future and future of commercial banks, uh, but uh, as much as the balance sheet risks are concerned, not so much internalization of uh, uh, huge uh, climate change problems that are, that are ahead, so not sufficient. We have to do more. I hope that we're going to do a part of the business with you here in Slovenia, of course. Um, Maureen, uh, so Banks have now quite a lot of regulation already evolving in regarding the climate change, but also not only climate change, but generally the ESG considerations. What are the main challenges that the banks are facing when they're incorporating this into their business models? Um, yeah, I, I must say, I think uh, everywhere uh, where you listen, I think one of the major challenges uh, that banks uh, feel that they face are obviously uh, the lack of uh, data we just had on the table. <laughs> uh, you contested that, but I think that that is, that is really uh, a major issue. I can name, uh, for instance, a simple um, example. I recently uh, spoke to uh, another uh, bank uh, where it comes then to the um, the, to the classification of mortgage portfolios. Uh, so there are 
uh, really uh, lack of disclosures uh, because uh, not every country, for instance, uh, has a public APC uh, labeled data uh, base. Uh, so the, 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 the feeling is that if we don't have access to these data, how can we uh, disclose it? Um, but I said, okay, but you do to, in a way, also by means of building standards, you do have access to data um, that actually tells you something on, on how energy efficient certain uh, mortgage loans are. Yes, was the argument, but then we have to uh, then we have to rely actually on reg on regulation. But I think, yeah, well, if there is anything uh, you should be able to rely on, that is that if, uh, for instance, a house is built conform a cer certain building standard, that you can actually uh, that it's actually credible uh, that it has a certain uh, energy uh, performance standard. So I think. Um, with all the regulatory developments, also in the fields of disclosures, all the disclosures that, that banks have to make, be it for pillar one, uh, so be it for that pillar through three dis disclosure requirements, be it uh, taxonomy uh, disclosures uh, related, it does come down uh, to uh, data availability. And that is something that, um, in my view, uh, will gradually evolve. Uh, all the regulatory developments uh, are in place to support that um, and to support also banks going forward in better identify um, uh, which loans are actually environmentally sustainable or not uh, on their balance sheet and to make further uh, disclosures uh, on that. Yeah, let me just, just say that we have tomorrow another event here at the Bank of Slovenia where, where we are going to discuss exactly these issues with banks and supervisors. Um, and this brings me actually to you, Tina, again. Uh, I, if you read the last ESRB reports, they are saying that banks are still reporting quite a lot of white noise regarding the, regarding the climate. And of course, uh, the EC, ECB agenda is very strong here now on climate. But I would particularly like to ask you what, uh, what is going on in the Bank of Slovenia. Uh, yes, so um, at the Bank of Slovenia, of course, we uh, do our actions also in the context of the Euro system wide action. So reflecting our new monetary policy strategy that was adopted last year, where we together with the ECB and our central, other central banks really embarked by an ambitious um, agenda. Uh, let me say, first of all, that, of course, our uh, mandate is clear. Our focus is price stability. So whatever we will do, is, uh, it will be without prejudice to this uh, price stability objective. Um, nevertheless, uh, we have committed uh, on many fronts. And uh, let me first mention the one that is uh, very advanced for the monetary policy side. It's in the context of the ECB, but I think it's, uh, it's relevant also for our banks. Uh, basically, so um, just in July, there was a first announcement and the first concrete uh, announcement last week on the uh, bond, um, uh, uh, corporate bond. Um, what, uh, so basically, we plan to tilt our bond holdings towards more uh, uh, towards less, uh, let's say, uh, carbon emission uh, 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 companies. And this will start already as of 1st of October. So I think this is very much reality. The other thing is the uh, collateral requirements. So we will also here look at the companies that, or at the assets that are, let's say, have less uh, carbon footprint, what we take, what people, uh, what banks can pledge as collateral. And we will also here uh, require disclosure of this collateral when the directive will become available as of next year. And we also take this into account in our internal um, and uh, risk practices. So this is what is, has been uh, already uh, happening. And uh, by this, um, our role is really not only to uh, mitigate our risk exposure, but also to promote uh, transparency and disclosure. So in, in this way, we will promote the overall uh, green transition. And some final words on our internal uh, Bank of Slovenia uh, processes. Uh, so uh, we have uh, committed as other central banks with a pledge and it's also part of our strategy to contribute to the green agenda. And uh, uh, one area that we have been very active is on the disclosure of our own portfolio 
since uh, nine, 2019, we have had targets for sustainable and environmental um, bonds in our own portfolio, uh, which has been increasing uh, now 7%, and we will make the public disclosure of this uh, climate-related uh, disclosure uh, next, uh, in the first quarter of next year. So this is one very concrete uh, step. The other one is that we have conducted climate stress tests for the large banks together with the SSM, but for the smaller banks here in Slovenia, we have done it as well. Uh, that was a lot of cooperation, also helping our data and all these issues. So this was, uh, I think we were very active on that front. Uh, we are measuring our own uh, carbon footprint here in-house and we will do the plan how to, to reduce it. Um, and overall, I think we are um, trying to acquire knowledge. We have had invited Professor uh, Kaifesh Bogatai recently to, to share her expertise and knowledge on that. Um, and so we are trying to get this awareness in the house, building into the models and our experts to be active in various uh, groups. No, I mean, excuse me, I'm going to skip you for a while because I think the, that Tina opened an important debate on the, on, on the regulation set by the supervision. Uh, so Maureen, uh, how are the regulatory developments affecting the banking sector currently? Are they too tight? Uh, <laughs> too <laughs> No, I I, uh, I think given the urgency uh, of climate change, um, well, in my view, regulatory uh, developments, um, uh, they cannot be uh, too tight. And I think actually the regulator is also pretty much uh, aware of the challenges uh, that the banking sector, for instance, is facing. If you look, for instance, at the uh, disclosure requirements under the ta taxonomy uh, regulation um, uh, for NF. Uh, uh, our deep purposes, banks are granted a year extra uh, just to be able to see uh, the corporate in disclosures and incorporate that in their own uh, disclosure uh, requirements. Um, I think there are, uh, in terms of, uh, I, I just already mentioned that disclosures are definitely a challenge for the for the banking sector, um, but there are also uh, other uh, elements, name performance, the energy performance of buildings uh, directive. There are also concerns uh, within the banking sector uh, regarding stranded assets that are that were already uh, mentioned um, earlier on. Uh, in my view, uh, this also actually uh, offers banks uh, with a great uh, opportunity to also uh, further engage uh, with, with, with their clients uh, and be part actually of their uh, transition. Um, so I think there are definitely uh, for the banking sector um, <laughs> challenges, like for everybody, also for corporates. Uh, but I think uh, we need that. Having said that, I also uh, think that these regulatory uh, uh, developments are actually quite uh, important um, because uh, you can have all these nice plans that you uh, want banks to be there to finance actually uh, the transition. Uh, but if a bank uh, grants a loan, uh, to a mortgage taker, it's for instance never going to say, okay, uh, I'm not granting you uh, this loan anymore because you are living in a house that is uh, less um, environmentally uh, sustainable. So I think in, in order for the private sector to also uh, be part of this transition, uh, you really need also the regulatory support uh, and public sector su support in terms of uh, uh, taxing or subsidizing um, this transition. Uh, otherwise, we are not uh, going to, to get there. Um, I think it's something we are all uh, part of and should be part of. Yeah. And Damian, uh, turning to you, so at the EIB, we have several documents, very important ones, uh, how the EIB is going to go about climate change, climate roadmap. We now recently issued transport policy. How about it? What are the main objectives? Where do you want to go? You started already this a bit, but if you could just uh, elaborate a bit more. Well, we, we publish uh, our objectives in, in our yearly sustainability report before it was uh, 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 named differently. Um, but uh, we, we have uh, several other objectives. We are not only a green bank, so we have to, to account uh, for all other objectives too. Um, 
in terms of pure green transition, we try really to to promote the idea uh, in in the banking sectors, and and I think the the banking sector in Slovenia has has done huge efforts to 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 the for the assessment of of their own portfolio in terms of uh, ESG, um, and uh, we will go from there. Um, as far as the concrete programs uh, are targeting. Our targets, internal targets, as I said, are not met. Uh, so we will have to implement huge changes in, in, in the approach. Uh, I have some skepticism that the banking sector, I think the pure banking sector uh, comes here. Uh, uh, people demand too much from the banking sector. I think uh, the transition will involve much more public resources. Uh, and these public resources can be then transition uh, efficiently used through banking sector or through uh, through um, uh, through uh, development banks. Pure to, pure pure regulation will will only help banks managing their own risks, uh, but this is not sufficient for the transition. This is really a small part, um, and I mean. Uh, we are a bank, a regulated, regulated bank, so we are doing all the, also the, our own uh, carbon footprint uh, and, and this type of strategies. But the, the really the difference, the, the difference uh, in terms of financial support for the transition is not, not yet there. I mean, quantitatively, it's not yet there. Even, even in all the banks implement ESGs and, and for example, set the objectives as us, so the, to, to improve every year the score of ESGs because you, you don't know where you are. I mean, you don't have the metric where you should be. Uh, so this will take years. And I, I believe we should accelerate the, the movement and involve public resources. Okay, thank you. I would stop here for a while and I would ask if there is any question among participants for our panelists. I think there is a mic just a second we have a microphone so that we can hear you uh, and hi, please Jan. introduce please introduce yourself I am Suranic from Grinska Banka um, my question is for um, Damian is there some new plans of uh, green bond issues from SIT and maybe if you can explain us um, the the yield to maturity should be higher or lower than non-green bonds. Thank you. Uh, our objective is to continuously have at least one bond issuance uh, uh, in our balance sheet. Uh, we were the first in Slovenia to, to tackle, to use this instrument. Uh, but, uh, and then, of course, with all the reporting uh, and um, um, requirements uh, on the investment side. So because you, you cannot do what you want with this money. You have to really uh, verify uh, transparently that uh, you invested in, in, in green transition. Um, problems. Uh, first, um, there is some... Uh, preferences from the from the financial investors for green bonds but uh, at the moment this greenium so this premium so the the lower price you have to pay for such an issuance and then we are transmitting this to 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 our clients uh, is small is much too small so the, the, the discriminatory power of being green and have more administration and have a normal issuance is very low and not sufficient for, for probably most of, most of uh, commercial banks to, 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 to be involved in this. If the regulation changes, so if you have a huge differences in, in terms of collateral use with the euro system or other types of 
of elements and intervene. So you will have uh, uh, a clear discrimination uh, in prices, and then you will have much more banks that have to issue bonds on the market that will that will opt for green issuance. But uh, of course, then you have to perform. You have to transparently uh, show uh, what, what is your what is the portfolio generated with these green bonds, um, and this is also very difficult. Uh, and this, of course, uh, requirement requires you to to have a, a, an, an external independent uh, auditor for 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 the assessment. So so you, for for the commercial bank, you really have to have huge price incentive, which is not there in the market. Uh, so we do it because it's we, we are the development bank. We we have to show the way. But currently, I don't see I don't see a lot of possibilities uh, in terms of incentives for the commercial sector unless you're a big bank and you have this in, enshrined in the center of your strategy which is not the case for the moment for the majority yeah i think our fund funding specialists would also agree with you. i'm not i'm not a funding specialist but uh, i think that they would confirm your stance as you know eib is also one of the biggest uh, green bond issuers and certainly, I think that this proves a point that regulation, uh, public and private sector need to go hand in hand. Otherwise, if we're having different objectives in mind, I think we will never really properly support the green transition. Any other question from the, from the audience? Hvala. Christian Hvala is Združenja Bank. I would like to seize this opportunity of having uh, the privilege of uh, the attendance of Mrs. Schuller uh, coming from the Netherlands. Um, the banks, as you said, face enormous challenge uh, regards the data availability, or better said, unavailability, which is recognized also by the regulators and all the stakeholders practically. Um, here in Slovenia, banks see enormous need to get access to different sources of data because privately they are not available yet or are just becoming available. And we need, of course, a longer data series to perform um, uh, some analysis and uh, get some findings, as also Mr. Kozamernik mentioned. Um, are there any projects uh, in the Netherlands um, that would help banks to get access to some public sources or some repositories of data on ESG characteristics of individual firms, uh, companies, that would help them bridge this gap and access the data as soon as possible. And of course then, to, to serve the goal and, and, and reach the desired uh, goal of uh, channeling the sources to the right cause. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would like to, to uh, um, put my answer a bit uh, broader than that, um, because I think also the data uh, availability uh, will pretty much also be, be driven by regulatory initiative. Uh, think about uh, the developments in the field of the uh, European Single Access Point. Think again about the uh, energy performance of building directive that actually requires uh, that, uh, that there will be a publicly available uh, national uh, database. Um, as I said, I think we are still uh, right at the beginning um, of all these disclosure uh, requirements. Uh, many of these requirements, um, particularly under the uh, CSRD, they yet have to be uh, developed. I think this is a, this is a, a pro you already also highlighted, this is a process of years and um, yeah, we have to grow, go uh, through this process also to get this better uh, data availability. I think at, at some point we will indeed get to a point that the data availability, uh, hopefully for uh, non-financial uh, disclosures, will be as good as they are currently for financial uh, disclosures. Any other question? So maybe before closing, uh, Tina, since you are the co-organizer, I would give floor to yours. We were talking a lot about uh, challenges, uh, how wrong everything could go from, uh, from the scenarios that we also saw from the Professor Kaifesh Bogatai. But what do you think about opportunities, particularly for Slovenia? What would you say 
that uh, on, so that we end up this uh, discussion on more on a more positive note. Yeah, I think every crisis is an opportunity, as they say, no. And I think, as I managed before, I think that. Um, this uh, obvious investment need in Slovenia is really an opportunity that we should take now. So it has been, we, I think all agreed, it has been shown that we need to uh, embark on this green transition early. So basically cure is, uh, so prevention is better than cure. So, and I think we should not miss this opportunity and accelerate investment, accelerate um, the possibilities to finance this investment, and um, I think this will also alleviate then uh, pressures uh, for us central bankers. So thank you very much, dear panelists. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I would like to again thank Gover uh, Governor Vasile and his team for co-organizing this event with us, and I hope to see you next year. Thank you very much.